For Krima Media's Quality, I'm Sane Lamini. Joining me today is lawyer, legal researcher, and commentator Dan Mafora to discuss his book titled Capture in the Court in Defense of Judges and the Constitution. So, Mr. Mafora, you say that this book is about a more insidious form of state capture. Why do you think uh, this book is important, especially as we are approaching the elections? So this book is important because as we are heading into elections, attacks on judges and the courts are going to become more and more frequent and more and more popular. And this book basically tries to point out uh, what these these attacks look like and what they are aimed to do and to help people to resist them or to uh, be able to identify them when, when they're happening in public. And so this book comes at a time where uh, obviously it's a very contested, very um, busy political time. And in order for people to kind of campaign and score political points, judges are going to become victims and scapegoats going into the elections. Former President Jacob Zuma, who has never had good relations with the judges, was arrested for civil contempt of court, which led to eight days of what is now called July 2021 unrest. Why do you think the Constitution has become the primary target uh, for populist attacks in the country? So I think that it's become the target for populist attack because of the kinds of powers that it gives to judges, um, because of the kinds of uh, obligations that it imposes on the government, right? So when Section 26 of the Constitution says everyone has the right to housing, that means that the state or the government has an obligation to make sure that everyone has access to adequate housing. Now, what has happened is we have seen that the state has failed to make that right real, to make adequate housing available to everyone, especially poor and marginalized people. So when the question arises, why has the government failed? Why do people still not have houses 30 years or 29 years after democracy? Politicians point to the constitution and they say that this constitution is the reason why um, we are unable to provide or we're unable to deliver. And because judges have the primary job or the primary function of enforcing the constitution, making sure that it is um, adhered to, they are also then targeted or scapegoated as the reasons for the government's failures. But we know that these, these government failures do not have anything to do with the constitution and the courts. And we know that the courts specifically have tried in the past to compel the government to deliver on, on what it, it is supposed to. Mm. And in the book, you speak of our former statesman, uh, the late Nelson Mandela, as a man who, even as a sitting president, respected the constitution and the courts. Uh, and you made an example of, of the South African Rugby Football Union case. Why do you think now that the respect for the constitution and courts by our leaders is lacking today? So there's there's a chapter in the book where I talk about the history of the ANC and the kind of constitutional thinking and how that question was never resolved within the ANC itself. So there were parts of the ANC that valued constitutionalism more than other parts. And Mandela was kind of the face of that one part of the ANC that really did uh, value the idea of an independent judiciary, the idea of a supreme constitution, to the extent of having himself put on the stand in court. And that was very important to kind of show this idea of equality before the law, to show that the president, you know, like everyone else, is subject to the law. Now, there, there are parts uh, of the ASC that don't think that way, that think that the elected representatives, the politicians should be above uh, the law and should not be subject to being controlled by this constitution. Um, and so it, it, it is, a, is a very long and complicated history that is not entirely straightforward, but certainly it has to do something with the internal uh, politics of the ANC itself.
Mm, and would you say that this narrative is damaging in the way maybe now the public upholds the law in our country? Absolutely. I think that we are seeing more and more disregard for the law because people no longer, you know, have that kind of moral regard for the law where if you have a court judgment against you, you have to obey it. We're seeing more and more now uh, people going back to court because court orders are not being followed. And that is kind of like this gradual um, erosion of the idea of a rule of law where people just disregard what courts are saying. And that is the effect of these kinds of attacks. You also raise an important point that as far as the constitution and the law are concerned, uh, there are serious knowledge gaps that are also quite easy to exploit. How can this issue be addressed? So the only way we will be able to address that is if we make the study of the constitution or the study of the legal system more accessible to the public. And I talk in the book towards the end about the role that uh, government departments like the the Office of the Chief Justice, like the Department of Justice, can make this happen. Um, and, you know, South Africa is one of a few countries that doesn't uh, have civics education at high school level. Civics education simply mean, you know, educating citizens about how the country works, how the government works, uh, what are elections, who, what is the president, what is the role of parliament, what is the role of courts. And that kind of knowledge is important for everyone and not just lawyers. And so in the book, I try to say that we need more public education uh, in a way that is very easy to understand, very easy to digest, and we need to make it popular to talk about the constitution and the law, and not just as a thing that lawyers do, but as any as a thing that every one of us does because we are citizens of this country. And you also address the issue of cameras in courts, which has become a norm in our country, bringing another dimension. And you've also made an example of how uh, advocate Dalimpofo has reacted when uh, in court, especially in front of the cameras and other politicians. Tell us about that. So because, you know, for a long time, the work of judges and the work of lawyers was quite obscure. It wasn't something that was... Uh, openly out there in the public. And since now there's greater access to court and we are able to see and experience um, court proceedings for ourselves, there seems to be this thirst or this hunger from the public um, for more and more of this, this kind of action, as one would call it. But we've also seen, on the other hand, that lawyers have also started performing for the cameras and in a way that doesn't really advance the cases that they, they're representing, right, or the clients that they're representing. The other example is someone like um, advocate Melissa Defo, who has just disbarred. And we see this because they get in return that media attention, that social media attention, that popularity, um, that we, we see them behaving badly when the TV cameras are on them. And that for me is a concern because one, um, these advocates have ethical duties that they need to carry out and they are being distracted. But two, what ends up happening is that uh, instead of law, what we get is this political grandstanding, political speeches being made in court. And that really detracts from the real work that judges and, and lawyers need to do. And so for me, although it is a benefit um, having open justice and seeing, you know, uh, how, how the law works, there needs mm -hmm. to be a counterbalance in how in, in the kinds of behavior that we allow to be displayed in court. And my last question would be, what else what do you think is important in this book so that the people will buy uh, your copy? So this book covers a number of topics, uh, but what I would like to point out is the chapter on populism, where I warn against the hijacking of our institutions by populists who try and use them for their own goals. And another chapter where I address uh, the kind of myths 
um, that are surrounding the Pretoria High Court that's been accused of being captured or in favor of the president. Um, and of course, there's a chapter on decolonization and the decolonization of the constitution, where I kind of respond to some of the arguments that have been made in that area. And it's it certainly isn't just for lawyers, it's written in an accessible way. And I would be really happy if people could buy a copy and engage. There was Dan Mafora in conversation with Polity, discussing his book titled Capture in the Courts in Defense of Judges and the Constitution.